Okay, so the next one into what makes this program tick is going to be Mastetics Power Systems programs. Mastetics, um, I believe these programs were written by Simon, and I was able to review them. I didn't actually do them. Um, I was able to review them because of the split between Legion Iron. Um, if you follow that mess at all, basically Simon and Garrett got into a big fight, and it sounds like Garrett is being a prissy piece of shit um, who gives people STDs and some other stuff. But honestly, I don't know. I don't care. And I didn't know what Mastetics was about. I didn't follow it that much. Sounds like typical powerlifting, unnecessary drama. There are a lot of programs here. And um, you could generally say that these are power building programs. That's what they are. And what that means is that Yes, you're doing the squat, bench, press, deadlift, but you're also doing a lot of accessory work. That said, you could see some of the character of the author, of the, of the author in the programming, and um, that may be good, may not be good. So let's get into it. What does Mastetics will look at? Full power one and two. I couldn't put three because three. Um, would have put me over the week limit. I can only do 13 weeks. So, as before, we assume the follow the program was followed to a T, which might not be a reasonable um, expectation. You might not be able to follow it to a T. Um, we have assumed no strength progress, and we have assumed that um, the we have assumed that. Um, and for this particular build, I have actually normalized volume. So 1RMs have all been set to 100. And what that should show you is that uh, a normalized tonnage effect, which is one way of looking at things. Now, one thing that you will notice right off the bat, by number of lifts, there is a lot less squatting volume than there is deadlifting volume. And I tell you, if you even plugged in normal, normally distributed numbers, you would still see that. It would not look as severe as this, but it would actually look much the same. Um, and this is actually a percent-based program, so they'll give you a percentage, and then you would hit it for a prescribed number of reps. Now, um, I think it's important to think about it that way because um, sometimes percentage and rep um, combinations don't make sense. So. For example, if I told you I wanted to hit your 1RM for two reps, like that's not how 1RMs work. 1RMs are 1RMs. In the same case, if you use a straight percentage and you say I want you to hit 75% for 32 reps, that's not realistic. Most people can't do that. And I think that's where relative intensity comes into play um, because some of those things don't make sense. You could be asking to people to go beyond their absolute grind. So it's percent based, um, low, low, low amount of squatting, and it is spe specifically written in as high bar squatting. And you could say, oh, well, that's because it's a power building program, it's all about aesthetics, da 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 da. Yeah, but uh, a lot of their appeal tends to be with like power lifters, so you would expect a lot more low bar. And I say that as a guy who high bar squats. Um, and there is a lot, a lot of deadlifting. And I'm not saying in comparison to squats. I'm talking about there's a lot of deadlifting in comparison to bench pressing. Like it seems like it's an equal amount of bench pressing and, and um, deadlifting, like on the whole. So that just seems irregular to me. Um, so if you look at the way it's structured... Um, you do see intensity increasing and volume decreasing for the first four weeks. And that all seems fine, normal. But then week five, everything shoots up. Volume shoots up, intensity decreases. And once you go on to the follow-on weeks, you have another increase in intensity and a decrease in volume. So it kind of waves up and down. Now, these are two six-week programs. They're not meant to flow one into the other. They're just meant for you to follow them however you want. 
So you really do have to consider week 1 to 6 and then week 7 to 12 as separate programs and think that they have no, they're not supposed to have continuity with one another. So does it make sense? Well, in terms of percent 1RM, you're building up to 85% from like 68-ish on average, right? So yeah, you're going to see some strength return on that. Um, but in terms of relative intensity for weeks one through six, one way to think about this is an at nine RPE is a lot to do, right? And at nine RPE means that you only got one left in the tank. In terms of relative intensity, that's about 97%. If you look here at week three, especially on your squat, that is a whole lot of grind going really, really close to failure, very close to the line. So you were taking that for an absolute grind in. When I saw it, it was a crazy amount. It, it was for repeated efforts that that happened. So to me, that did not make sense. Like you can't expect someone to go for an at 10 effort for multiple attempts. It just never pans out. They either have to reduce weight or they have to reduce reps. It just does not work, in my opinion. And what's weird is even on, like, week six, you, you do have deadlifts get up there. Um, and deadlifts, on the whole, they, they are kind of like lower effort lifts until you get to that week six, and that's when it really kicks up and it's up in grind town. For an average of at nine, uh, RPE or 97% relative intensity. So if 100% is a new rep max, 97% is you're getting very close to a new rep max. Um, and for repeat efforts, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think it makes sense at all, but that's what they did. So week seven to week 12, um, you generally start at roughly the same intensity range and it ramps up, and again, you have that wave, and it kicks way up. However, on the average, for deadlifts and bench presses, it kind of drags down, and you see that with relative intensity. Now, here's what's important. That same preference for really taking a squat to grind town happens again. It happens again, and it goes above 100%. So what that tells me is that is actually a number of reps that your average person cannot do. Now, I say your average person. There are some people who do have like this high acute work capacity for lifts, and that's not uncommon. It's really common for women lifters, and it's really common for people who are new to powerlifting. So those people might not have an issue with it. However... If you've been doing powerlifting for like a year and a half or longer, I don't think that's going to be a possible prescription. Um, so, But I think the reason they do this is because if you look at it on the whole, it's a no, low number of sets for squats. So I think the only way you get the training stimulus is by working it hard. And if you look at the average R relative intensity, you got... You got them in a 100% range here, 98.6. And your peaks are, you have a lot of them are at 9, at 10 RPE, or 96 to 100%. You also have like the standard deviation. So here you'll see like, oh, well, oops. Uh, how do I undo that? Okay. So I also did the standard deviation. So you could tell if it's a complex loading pattern. Are they all at 100% RI? No, not for this one. Um, however, next week, they're all, all of them, all three, all six sets are at nine RPE, nine and a half RPE or higher. That's crazy to me. That makes no sense. And if you look at the peak intensities and average intensities, like, there's not much difference in loading. These are straight set schemes, and I think that's the way it would be if you're doing only six sets. Bench pressing, this is, like, more tolerable. Um, 20, mid-20s is kind of high, but that's for, that's, it's high 
considering what most programs prescribe. However, I do think that is entirely possible for a lot of people. And that is generally where I sit at and where I make improvements is 25 sets or higher. Um, peak relative intensity, again, getting up into these high at nine efforts. However, with bench press, I think you do have some more benefit with that. So I think that is called for. Um, I do think you have to learn to grind bench press more than you do deadlifts. Now, average relative intensity is where it gets really weird. Um, however, 78% doesn't drop from 94 to 78. Well, look at the standard deviation. That's just complex loading. That's what that means. So you're getting up to 88%-ish. So not much a change in stimulus there. Average intensity, kind of on the low side. But your peaks are getting you in the neighborhood of 85 to 95 and in terms of standard deviation of the loading, you're seeing a lot more difference there. A lot of variation, especially on the first and last weeks, which are over 10%, right? Deadlifts, um, you're going to see a lot more preference for this. Now look at this, 20 sets of deadlifts per week. I don't think I've ever done that many. And that's when I was saying the character of the programmer tends to come out. Um, I believe there are some people who really, really do excel at doing deadlifts, and they have a high deadlift work capacity. Uh, Bryce Krawcheck is a great example of someone who I think does prefer high deadlift volumes, and I believe he kind of programs from the same viewpoint, and Bryce Krawcheck is known for his deadlift, um, so that makes perfect sense to me for that person. Does it make sense for everyone else? No, not necessarily. There are some people who have terrible deadlift work capacity, and I am one of them. I have incredible squat work capacity. However, that doesn't mean that I assign everybody 25 squat working sets per week. Um, I don't assume everyone has that. And I don't assume that everyone can work up to that. Um, so I think assuming 20 that they could get up to on both programs is a little ridiculous. I, I, I think they overestimate um, how well the program works for the norm um, or the average person. Um, and again, relative intensities, averages are getting really high, especially in this first block that gets up to 9 RPE, and the peaks are getting to 100. And the standard deviation here is a little higher but on that last week, it's pretty low. So it's like you're going to get to 9 RPE or 10 RPE or 8 RPE. 8 is the easy sets. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, there's no overhead pressing in this, so that's not a huge concern. However, the tonnage change is actually, um, let's see, look at the exponentially weighted um, moving Average, like, yeah, that does make sense. So here's your intensity distributions. You could see that they kind of have, like, I don't know. Um, they're kind of samesy across the board. Um, it is a very slow progression, but it is what it is. For squats. For deadlifts, you do see some change over time. And you could see week one to six what direction it's headed, which this makes a lot more sense than what's here because that's averaged everything out, right? But this kind of makes more sense. And then you can see that last week, even though you do have a huge drop off in average intensity, when you look at it like this, like that 70, that 75% below, that's just practice work pretty much, practice reps. And deadlifts is where it gets a lot varied, and I believe that that's just um, that wave-like loading pattern um, that they follow. So let's go to the three criteria. Um, the three criteria is basically, like, is it safe? That's the first one. And honestly, I don't think, I don't think the deadlift volumes makes sense. I don't think that's within the realm of reasonable. Um, 
And I think with how high these relative intensities go, that it makes sense at all. Um, and I'm not saying that going for all-out efforts is dangerous 100% of the time, but I do think it's a little bit ridiculous. I do think that. Um, so I think it kind of borders on me saying it could be not the safest. I'm not saying it is unsafe. I'm saying it could be not the safest. And I think that's that's an issue that people think of is like they think, oh yeah, too high intensity is dangerous. Too high volume is dangerous. It's like, no, it's not that they are as a whole. But like if you look at it from the, the idea of like too much of all of one or more or too much change in one or more does kind of raise an eyebrow or two, right? And I think there's enough elements involved that it does make me question that. And then there's adherence, and that directly ties into the same thing that I was talking about with deadlift volume. I think the deadlift volumes are ridiculous. Um, and I think that that's more due to the character of the person that wrote it. Like, it seems like it's a program they wrote for themselves and a couple other people who have around the same work capacity and tolerance, training tolerances, and it works for them. I'm not saying this is bad for everybody, but it works for a very particular type of person, I would think. Um, is it easy to understand? Yeah, it's, it's generally pretty easy to understand. I'm not going to say it isn't. Um, and then there's outcomes. Well, what's the outcome here? Well, the outcome is kind of power building-ish. It's aesthetics, so it's powerlifting-ish, but it's generally more focused on gaining size. So does it do that? Yeah, I think it's within the realm. However, I think that's dependent on whether or not <coughs> you have a really strong hypertrophy response to deadlifts or squats. And I do think that there are certain types of people who do get a lot more out of deadlift work for hypertrophy than they do squat work. And I think that's what the author has. Um, however, I would say that for the good, sizable chunk of people who get a better response from the squat, from hypertrophy, given that it is more work per lift because it is a significantly longer range of motion and close enough weight to your deadlift, I would say outcome, kind of skeptical. Um, and... So, I mean, that's three the three main criteria that I look at. And honestly, that's kind of, it, to be iffy on all three does raise some red flags. Now, one thing I didn't talk about is I talked it was percent-based, but where are the variations you use? Well, you could see that it's a lot of high bar. Everything is high bar. There is, I think, two weeks of low bar. And... Um, High bar squat and high bar pot squat. For bench press, you're going to get a lot of floor press, a lot of close grip, and a lot of floor press and pause. So what that means is this is really going to work for you on the bench press end, especially if you have a tricep lockout issue, which is actually not most people. Most people, I believe, um, have an issue off the chest, not on lockout. But that's not necessarily outcome. Outcome is size, and who doesn't like huge triceps, right? Now, in terms of the deadlifts, they actually have this deadlift and your alternate stance deadlift. So you're going to end up doing whatever deadlift style you don't like anyways. Stiff legs, which I like. And then block pulls, um, sumo deadlifts, and then a conventional pause off the floor deadlift. Um, so those are a lot of deadlift variation, not much squat variation. But then again, there's not much squatting involved anyways. And all the bench press variations seem to target one central thing, and that's lockout strength or just tricep size. And I believe it's tricep size because if you look at the accessories, um, here's what they are, tricep isolation. And that's it. There's actually not 
any accessory work other than tricep isolation work, which is kind of weird to me in a power building program. But in general, would I recommend this program? Eh, not really. If you wanted a power building program, I think there's better power building programs that have a lot more accessory work to really build on size. Do I think it works on strength? Mm, no, not sure. I don't think so. I mean, you're below 85%, but if you need to learn how to grind, this will definitely get you there. So, would I recommend it? Eh, it is free. So it does have that going for it. But anything else, no. Uh, I think you can follow most other programs with better success. In any case, that is Mastetics Full Power 1 and 2.